big jump to color, eh? In 2002, we got Ruby and Sapphire. Initially, these two were conceived as reboots of Pokemon, scrapping the old and starting fresh. Transferring from the Game Boy to the new Game Boy Advance was a difficult task, so why bother? But someone at Game Freak thought different. Repopulate the games with old Pokemon via a series of side games. None the least, a full-blown remake of Red and Blue, not even 10 years off from the original. Fire Red and Leaf Green brought those classics to a new era, for better and worse, in 2004, when these games weren't yet yearly, modernizing the mechanics up to the then-current style of Ruby and Sapphire, while still maintaining a fairly strict adherence to the originals. The best part about talking about Fire Red and Leaf Green is how little I need to talk about gameplay. I did it in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, with the only major deviation from that game being the physical special split was still a ways off. Normal fighting, flying, poison, ground, rock, bug, ghost, and steel moves are always physical, while fire, water, grass, electric, psychic, ice, dragon, and dark are always special. Fire Red and Leaf Green have very few gameplay flourishes, maybe too few in a few ways. Introducing a few new HMs as field moves, Rock Smash, which is never needed for progression and only optionally needed once or twice, Waterfall, which can only be used in one single optional post-game room, and Gen 3's 8th HM, Dive, is entirely absent from the game. The only new encounter style from Red and Blue is Rock Smash, which exclusively has Geodude and Graveler. The game even removes features that its companions Ruby and Sapphire had, namely the in-game clock used for berries, which locks the game out of berry growth, and the two time-based evolutions, Espeon and Umbreon. You need to trade an Eevee into Ruby, Sapphire, or Emerald to evolve into either of these two. Although even if there was a timer in this game, new evolutions are arbitrarily locked to the post-game. It's honestly a fairly ridiculous element to the game. Only two Gen 1 Pokémon evolve into Gen 2 Pokémon without an item, meaning this lockout solely affects Golbat and Chansey, two Pokémon that are not great and could be much more tempting options should they be able to evolve. The pool is so small that it feels silly they'd waste time programming a block, although on the same foot, the pool of affected Pokémon is so small that most players will never notice. It's also worth noting that even though held items are in this game because they were introduced in Generation 2, they're not really found throughout the game until the post-game outside of the black glasses and maybe like Energy Road or another like fairly useless one. Some of them are hidden behind the item finder, but I don't know how many people are actually using that thing. Perhaps the best quality of life change in the game is the running shoes, which offer a middle ground speed between the bike and walking to get around. Although honestly, they're a bit superfluous here. You get them after the first gym, but get the bike as soon as directly after the second. And unlike Gen 4, a lot of interior areas don't allow running, including houses, Pokemon centers, and shops, and the entirety of the Pokemon Tower dungeon, limiting it mostly to being helpful in the Rocket Base and Sylph Company. There's obviously some sweeping changes. Abilities can add some mix-ups, and a few Pokemon are moved around because of their abilities. The Nidorans on 22 are almost certainly moved to 3 due to Poison Point being super irritating in the early game when most Pokemon only have physical normal moves. Although since Gen 1 Pokemon had abilities given to them retroactively, most of them don't have any crazy gimmicks or largely impactful abilities altogether. I think that wraps up a majority of the gameplay stuff. If you really need the full rundown, watch the Heart Cold Soul Silver video, I guess, and just keep in mind that the physical special split doesn't exist yet. Also, on the same note, I'm going to touch on very few Pokemon this time around. I've covered everything I need to, <laughs> perhaps too much. Starting here, most Pokemon get pretty well solidified. A few gained abilities between Generation 3 and 4, and a few are hampered by the lack of the physical special split. Gyarados is notably weaker with the Nerf Typer Beam and without physical water moves, but its ability Intimidate and Solid Special means it's still pretty great, and it gets even better in the next generation. Otherwise, you know, Pokemon like Sneasel are still very unfortunate, and there's a few other notable examples. But largely, pretty much everything exists between how it was in Gold, Silver, and Crystal, and uh, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Diamond and Pearl. As with its basis, Fire Red and Leaf Green are fairly similar games. No exclusive legendaries or other one offs, and very scant few changes between the two save the exclusives. Unfortunately, the exclusives this time are generally worse and kind of baffling. Not just in that there's more of them, but in that the selection is a bit, uh, all over the place. On the upside, Mankey and Meowth are no longer exclusive. Mankey copies its placement in the early game from Yellow as an anti-Brock option, and Meowth is a popular anime character, which makes it harder to justify making exclusive. Beyond that, the pairs from the original Red and Blue are copied over with some additions, with Fire Red copying Red's list and Leaf Green copying Blue's. In the completely unchanged category is Ekans vs. Sandshrew and Growl vs. Vulpix. 
The Oddish first Bell Sprout split becomes a little unbalanced, as Gloom has a new evolution in Blossom, which is balanced out by something else later. Similarly, Scyther vs. Pinsir also gives Red Scizor over Blue, and both Electabuzz and Magmar have new pre-evolutions in Magby and Elekid, although it's worth noting that all of these evolutions and pre-evolutions are strictly post-game. As for the new pairings, Fire Red gets Psyduck and Golduck, while Leaf Green gets Slowpoke, Slowbro, and in the post-game Slowking, which serves to balance out Blossom. To call a Nod pairing would be an understatement, as in Red and Blue, the pair are pretty separate from each other. They are both Water, but Slowpoke's line gets the Psychic typing, while Psyduck's is just left with some fairly weak Psychic coverage and both evolve at completely different levels. The absence of Slowpoke and Slowbro also hits the Seafoam Islands pretty hard for diversity, although not so much that it warps the game or anything. Shelter and Cloyster and Staryu and Starmie have also been split up. While this is a pretty sensible split, both evolved by Waterstone and are found with the Super Rod, with Shelter being physically focused and Staryu being specially focused, although in kind of the same way as Slowpoke, this split kind of guts the fishing pool and makes an already tedious task even more dull. All of the remaining exclusives are post-game only, consisting of a variety of Pokemon from Johto, which unfortunately can't be used in the game for the most part. Fire Red gets Wooper and Quagsire, while Leaf Green gets Meryl and Azumarill, plus their pre-evolution Azuril, one of the two Generation 3 Pokemon available in this game, which I guess balances out Scizor. Both are Johto water types that evolve at low levels, and exist as the odd water encounter that exists outside of surfing or fishing in grass. Next up are Murkrow and Mischievous. While seemingly not similar, both get evolutions by Duststone in the next generation, and both are fairly infamously locked to Kanto and Gold, Silver, and Crystal, making them post-game only, ironic as they're also post-game only here, because they aren't in Kanto. Both games have their own Johto Super Rod encounters, with Fire Red getting Quillfish and Leaf Green getting Remoraid, a Pokemon that evolves into Octillery. This is never balanced out. Leaf Green just gets an extra Pokemon. Granted, the similarity is pretty obvious. In Gold, Silver, and Crystal, they are fishing encounters that could be boosted via swarms, but it does feel odd that they didn't consider that one version just gets an extra Pokemon. Fire Red's Deli Bird and Leaf Green's Sneasel are fairly straightforward, both are half ice, and uh, I think that's about as deep as it goes. They just are found in the same place in this game. And then there's Skarmory and Mantine, which are both flying types that were in Gen 2, fairly unusual type combinations, and were paired in those games as well. They're both really defensive. And then lastly is Deoxys, which is a kind of weird situation, in that in the Generation 3 games, Deoxys' form was sheerly decided by what game it's in. It's normal form in Ruby and Sapphire, attack form in Fire Red, defense in Leaf Green, and speed in Emerald. An oddity that actually meant what game you owned impacted your ability to play competitively, with Fire Red and Emerald having strong arguments for being the strongest game for using the Oxus. I think largely the scales are a bit tipped in favor of Leaf Green here. In Red and Blue, it was a close call, but even without the extra Pokemon, Leaf Green getting Starmie and Slowbro gives it two pretty substantial Pokemon that are universally pretty great. And while Shelter is in its own right very strong, Golduck is much more questionable. Sizzler would be a great point for Fire Red, but like some of the other stronger pairings like Quagsire, Murkrow, and Skarmory, as well as Deoxys Attack, it's locked to the post game, at which point these Pokemon aren't really all that useful or necessary. Is all that controversial to call Fire Red and Leaf Green ugly anymore? I mean look, the battle sprites are generally nice, with only a few small exceptions, to the extent that a handful of moderately wonk sprites is hardly worth mentioning, but outside of that, the game is just dull and stripped of life. The games have blown out color palettes to compensate for the original GBA's terrible screen, and while that ultra-saturated look can be kinda cool on some elements, like the rich purples Pokemon like Starmie have, a lot of the time it's a bit neon-y and unappealing. It's an unfortunate symptom of the console, but it nonetheless does have an unappealing effect. Other than that, the sprite sheet on the overworld is just kinda lame. A lot of little unique elements that they manage on the colorless Game Boy have been sanded down and made uniform, ranging from completely trivial to kinda shocking. Like removing the dock from Cinnabar Island, a cute detail to show how the island survived in red and blue that's just gone missing despite literally having a scene where a boat comes to Cinnabar in this game. And the trees, oh man. They just threw trees everywhere. Pewter is a rugged mountain town that was surrounded by cliffs and rocks, plus pylons to show how it progressed into a more developed city in red and blue, coming out of the small towns of Viridian and Pallet. But here, trees, trees, trees. It's boring. It's not all bad, some areas still hold their original charm, like Pokemon Tower, but there's a lot of misses, and the general music quality doesn't help in the slightest. The compositions are still fine, there's nothing wrong on that end, but the GBA sound chip somehow sounds grimier than the Game Boy's beeps and boops, and the instrumentation on display is pretty basic. It's one of those things that just feels slightly off. Not game ruiningly so, but enough that you're like, this teeters on bland and bad. I don't hate it, but it lacks the charm in both directions. 
Red, blue, and yellow, and gold, silver, and crystal had a simplistic charm, and the Generation 4 games are so cleanly presented and do so much more with unique assets that they're way more interesting to look at. Fire Red and Leaf Green is kind of the worst of both worlds. Polished to the point that it's not nearly as charming as the originals were, but so simplistic that it's not really appealing either. You got the same basic grass and caves a dozen times with only a handful of standout areas. As with its predecessors, Fire Red and Leaf Green begins in Pallet Town, obviously. Some of the few Pokémon worth discussing in detail are the starters. Like before, they act as a difficulty selection, although all of them have had changes that are fairly impactful on how the game plays out, assuming you use your starter. Take Bulbasaur. While really good at the start in the original games, it quickly falls off as it basically peaks at Razor Leaf and has to use that for the entirety of the rest of the game. Here, while still peaking at Razor Leaf by level up, which itself is very nerfed by standardized critical hit mechanics, also has the option for Giga Drain for healing, but also has expanded utility. Sleep Powder is learned before it even evolves into Ivasaur, making it a great catching partner, but also gets some survivability in Synthesis, plus gets a genuinely great poison move in Sludge Bomb. While still falling off decently hard, Venusaur is able to crutch on utility stuff much easier to provide at least some use throughout, and while not optimal, Overgrow and its survivability can be a nasty combo. Charmander is definitely the most improved, for one it gets Flamethrower at a much more reasonable level, but also has a lot of solid coverage that was added to it. Early on it gets Metal Claw, which is a fairly weak steel move intended to help it with Brock, although Ember still tends to be better because Geodude and Onyx are just so physically bulky, but it's generally useful utility for the journey across Mount moon that Charmander hates so much. That's not even all of it either. Charizard has access to proper secondary stab through Wing Attack, Aerial Ace, and Fly, which provides a nice use for its decent physical stats, as well as Steel Wing to replace Metal Claw and Dragon Claw, which is a really solid special move that hits Neutron almost anything, giving Charizard a near universal option. As for Squirtle, I mean, Surf and Ice Beam haven't gotten worse, and Bike going from normal to dark has given it its own nearly universal move, a great option on dangerous psychics and neutral against anything that formerly could give it trouble, and the addition of Rain Dance gives Blastoise some really solid potential as a rain team lead. In all, I think all three starters have had some substantial improvements, even if things roughly shake out the same. Venusaur breezes through the early game but tapers off, Blastoise has the strongest set of options by a mile, but it doesn't get most of them for a while, and Charizard has a really terrible early game, but eventually evens out to be fairly powerful to the extent it can almost keep up with the big turtle guy. These remakes are pretty slavishly devoted to accuracy, especially early on, only taking some minor cues from Yellow. Route 1, for example, is completely unchanged, the clever path is unchanged, and like before, it's a 50-50 split on Rattaton Pidgey. One of the few things the game does take from Yellow is in Viridian City by making the catching tutorial mandatory. It feels a little bit silly if you've already caught some Pokémon, but it's appreciable that they want players to know the basics, and he does give you something pretty interesting for dealing with him, the TGTV. While not necessary for an experienced player, the item allows the player, at any time, even in battle, to press the L or R button to get a quick rundown on game mechanics, which is a bit overbearing, but a nice accessibility feature. But it also has a kind of neat secondary feature. Upon starting up the game, a slideshow of the last five key moments you performed is shown, which can be a nice refresher if you've been away from it. I can understand it not being standard, it can be a bit irritating if you've been playing consistently, but perhaps if it was shoved somewhere else as a journal entry or something, it could have been a good tool for a game intended to be played for a long time in short intervals. Route 22 is one that's found itself relatively gutted. The rival battle is unchanged, although his Pidgey only has a 1 in 3 chance of choosing Sand Attack as opposed to half, but both Nidoran have been booted from the route. I assume for fear that their poison point ability would make it difficult to train there, given that pretty much every move at this point makes contact, while maintaining the Mankey from Yellow for Brock, and of course Spearow the Good Bird. In Viridian Forest, Caterpie and Weedle are no longer soft exclusives, both appearing at a 40% rate, meaning regardless of version, Bulbasaur has a fairly strong advantage, while the other two have a fairly high risk of poisoning until they can one-shot Weedle, a change that does at least add a little bit of challenge to the dungeon in both versions. Pikachu is also still about, and hypothetically also poses an issue in that its static ability has decent odds to spread paralysis, although standing at a 5% encounter rate, it's decently unlikely to be an issue. Outside of the damn trees, Pewter remains mostly the same, although its gym has a bit of a mix-up in that Brock is actually substantially more difficult for Charmander. Bulbasaur and Squirtle are still going to have no real issues, but Onyx has had the rather exploitable Bide replaced with Rock Tomb. At 60 base power plus stab, the move is pretty devastating on the fire type, which isn't very well alleviated by the rather useless Metal Claw. Ember is still the better move, but Charmander's survivability is so low that alternate options or some good luck in burns and crits become fairly necessary for the poor lizard, which makes an already fairly miserable segment even harder, and feels a touch poorly thought out for a first boss, although you do get access to Rock Tomb after that, which is kinda cool. 
Road 3, while largely unchanged, serves as the new home for the Nidorans, which on top of Jigglypuff constitute a trifecta of contact abilities. Although given the grass is fully optional here, it's hard to imagine it being overly relevant. Also, for whatever reason, Nidoran is a soft exclusive here, where one of them is like a 20% encounter and one of them is a 1% encounter, depending on the game. That's like really low for this early in the game, that's kind of insane. Magikarp still costs too much when the old rod is so close, and it's rather notable that this is probably the lowest power level Gyarados has ever been at. With its lack of physical options and the generally improved movesets of everything else in the game, although Intimidate is really good. Mount Moon is one area with a sharp turn for the worst. Zubat and Geodude were already obnoxious given their confused chance and bulkiness, but Kefairy and Paris are also given contact abilities here, which can significantly slow progress through dungeon that's already long and tackled with limited tools. It's also a bit odd that one super nerd in the dungeon has Magnemite, whose new steel type is fairly difficult for Squirtle and especially Bulbasaur to deal with, and feels a bit like an oversight as far as it goes, with someone likely not considering the impact the type that defensive would have at this point in the game. As before, the dome and Helix fossils are one-offs, but at least the advent of breed in the post game makes the pair significantly easier to trade for. On other upside, Zubat is made a lot more tempting for Crobat, who is a very decent Pokemon, although it won't evolve until the post game, meaning it misses most of the difficult battles in the game, as most of the post game is a terrible cakewalk. Route 4 remains mostly unchanged, Ekans or Sandshrew are here, but notably it's the first instance of Tutors. Many moves that were formerly TMs, in this case Mega Punch and Mega Kick, were taken off the selection, and as such can be taught to a valid Pokemon once per save file. I think the one-off limit is a little silly, many of the move tutor moves are genuinely just not that great. Mimic, Explosion, at least for a story playthrough. Seismic Toss, but the sentiment of keeping the games intact through the accessibilities of these moves is kinda admirable. Route 24 and Route 25 are relatively unchanged. Abra, Bellsprout, and Oddish are made available. Notably, while still great, Abra's line is substantially less fantastic than in Gen 1, as its special defense is pretty meager. Also, Oddish can become Blossom in the post game, at the cost of dragging around a Gloom, mind you, which isn't that great of a deal, when Vile Gloom is arguably the stronger of the pair. Infamously, 24 is home to a glitch so embarrassing that even Gen 1 would blush. The rocket at the end of the bridge doesn't properly get flagged as having given you the nugget if you lose to him, so you can intentionally throw the game by bringing a single Caterpie or wheel or something. Collect nuggets, and even 20 minutes of this can set you up for the rest of the game and opens easy access to the normally pretty difficult to get game corner Pokemon. But more than anything, it's kinda nice to see the Game Freak never changes. Cerulean City is largely unchanged. The Jinx available by trade later is now named... Zinx? What did they mean by this? In the gym, both trainers can be dodged, although experience is so valuable in this bit of the game that it'd be kind of pointless to skip them. But Misty is also significantly improved. A pretty common theme, and honestly, fairly refreshing if you aren't using Charmander. Recover on Staryu and Starmie forces a lot of aggression, and Water Pulse is a bit better than Bubble Beam. The Confusion Chance can trip up even the less disadvantaged starters, but is also a nice present for Squirtle after defeating her. Row 5 being unchanged is disappointing. The daycare here still only accepts one Pokemon. The breeding daycare is solely post-game, which is a loss as breeding and egg moves could provide some good opportunities for new sets. I assume the opposition to Jotomons prevented it to avoid access to Hitmontop, as the other babies besides Syrogue are largely useless. Meowth is here in both games, although Persian is another Pokemon largely weakened by newer mechanics as its massive crit rate is curbed. Route 6 is also virtually unchanged, although here it hardly matters as there's nothing interesting to speak on, likewise for 11. The SSN has had a nice facelift, with really nice colors to complement its relaxing music, although its biggest change is the added convenience of an onboard healing room for the player, which makes healing a lot less tedious than running back to Vermilion if you need. Although perhaps the only gameplay change worth noting is that the rival's Ivysaur will have Sleep Powder, assuming you started with Squirtle, which is substantially more dangerous than anything it had in Gen 1. In the Vermilion Gym, the... puzzle is still intact. I wish it wasn't. Surge is a little more mixed as opposed to straight and prove. Shockwave is a lot weaker than Thunderbolt in base power and its inability to paralyze, but Pikachu and Raichu both have Thunder Wave to somewhat nullify that. Not to mention Static on all of his Pokemon to shut down physical attacks, and Double Team. Paired together, the two can make an RNG hell that doesn't have a lot of strong outs, save breaking Surge with Diglett. It's nice to see more complex strategies, but RNG strategies aren't that fun to play against. Uh, ever, really. Route 9 and 10 are virtually unchanged, the power plant is redesigned from the outside, making it look not like a big house, although that's not very relevant right now. 
Rock Tunnel, while still a pretty bad dungeon, actually isn't largely impacted in Fire Red and Leaf Green. Sturdy doesn't yet have its Focus Sash effect, so Onyx and Geodude aren't big issues. Zubat is pretty quickly falling off, and unlike Mount Moon, the dungeon isn't teeming with contact abilities. And the addition of a Rock Slide tutor is hard to complain about, even if the pool of eligible Pokémon isn't fantastic at this point. Unlike Red and Blue, the cave actually has items to find too, which is nice and makes Flash a little more tempting. Otherwise, it's still pretty easy to just barrel through it without Flash, but you'd be missing out on some cool items. Lavender has taken a bit of a weird visual hit. Gen 1 and 2 used dirt texture to indicate that it was a quiet rural mountain town, while the grass here just feels a bit thoughtless. That said, the new design of Pokemon Tower is pretty strong. Route 8 features one of the very few double battles in the game. Game Freak loves to neglect it despite it being the official competitive format, and I really do not get why. It's a nice change of pace to have double battles, and I would have loved to have seen more, but I think there's like three or four in the entire game, if that. It features so rarely that it just feels completely pointless to have it at all. Bikers on the route also scoot around in the latter half, which is a cute bit of dynamism that rarely appears in this game. Route 7 couldn't change if they wanted it to because it's pretty barren. Celadon is probably most improved visually. The skyscrapers are a good way to show how large it is relative to the smaller towns of the early game, and compared to Gen 1's big houses, is a pretty big change, especially as the game corner has a new gaudy design. Although sadly its prize counter has lost the ominous windows for something a bit more generic, which is a lost bit of environmental storytelling given the whole Team Rocket thing. <laughs> To idiot proof the Saffron guards and prevent soft locking, although the ability to rematch with the Versus Seeker already does that, the player no longer needs to buy a drink for them, and instead a woman in the condo gives tea as a key item. Uh, I think it's actually kind of easier to miss, because it's just some random woman sitting in one floor of a big ass building that most people won't bother to go into. Drinks can still be given to the girl on top of the department store for TMs, although the very powerful Ice Beam Rock Slide and Tri Attack are replaced by the rather useless, at least for like an in game story playthrough, defensive moves, light screen reflect, and safeguard. Eevee is also thankfully breedable now, which makes it even stronger as a freebie, as you can get all of them, except for Espeon and Umbreon for some reason. To delve into the game corner, this is the last game that features slots, which are largely unchanged from how they were before and still bore me. The prize TMs are substantially better than they were before, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, Flamethrower, Shadow Ball, although making them TM prizes also locks really strong moves into irritating grinding. As before, Porygon is much cheaper in Leaf Green as well, because... I don't know why they did that. The hideout underneath has the same layout, although there are two strong changes. The spinners launch the player almost comically fast, and the rocket doesn't withhold the key for no reason, so you don't have to talk to him a second time. Yes, that was fixed in yellow, but holy shit. Giovanni isn't substantially better. Kangaskhan's fake out and Mega Punch make it an even better bruiser, and Bite becoming dark gives it a smidge of coverage. Celadon Jim still lacks a real puzzle, and Erika's team isn't strongly tied together by anything interesting. All three have chlorophyll, but she doesn't use Sunny Day, unlike in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, so you'd need to gift her sun by using Sunny Day yourself to make her Pokemon better. Tangle is also a Pokemon that took a fairly big hit with the Binding move nerf, leaving it fairly helpless despite Ingrain giving it passive healing, and the abundance of birds means that she's still one of, if not the single weakest leader once again. Pokemon Tower fairly well survives the appearance transition that Lavender did not. The green and purple give the place a nice atmosphere that, while a bit gaudy, is still a good visual representation of decay. Gameplay-wise, the next few areas don't have a lot to say. The rival isn't significantly grown from the last battle, although Growlithe and Gyarados' Intimidate can threaten physical attackers, and Ghastly's Levitate severely undercuts one of its major weaknesses throughout the dungeon, although Bite is such a common move that it still has a decently common out, also having reduced levels across the dungeon because they were annoying. Route 16 never had that much of note, although Snorlax is a 50-50 chance of having thick fat, which can make it a solid asset and a really solid wall. Route 17, Cycling Road, remains largely intact, although oddly the route now lacks fishing encounters for some reason, and like 16, 18 is largely unchanged. Though the Lickitung trade now has version exclusive requirements, given that Slowbro is exclusive to Leaf Green, making Fire Red trade for its counterpart Golduck instead. Both are available in the wild, so it matters very little, but it's kind of strange that they wouldn't just be moved to some other thing that both games have. <sighs> the Safari Zone sadly remains unchanged. It's still a very tedious and unexciting slog to collect Pokémon in. I found it was harder to catch some Pokémon while these were easier. Bad luck or change catching mechanics, and I'm unsure, but it didn't really feel all that great. The 1% Dragonair encounter is something of a cruel joke, I mean, all 1% encounters are, but one that can also run away. 
Uh, it's even worse than the self-destructing coughing in the Celadon Pond, because at least there you can bring, like, damp to prevent that. The addition of surfing encounters is nice, and the additional 100 steps relieves the cost a little bit. Plus the failsafe against softlocks is in place just like yellow. But it's not like it's better than it was, it's a little easier to get through the first time. Better items in it in general, but it is still the safari zone. The gym's puzzle is a little less transparent, uh, or more transparent, in that unlike in red and blue, playing the game on a better screen doesn't show the walls, but Koga still operates largely the same, save for having Toxic on all of his Pokemon, which can put on some pretty significant pressure if he decides to use it, especially with the minimizing Muk, which also has acid armor, although his tactics still largely revolve around stalling and blowing up, which is not very effective against any competent player. 15, 14, 13, 12, not much to say. These are trainer routes for grinding, nothing has changed much, and it is what it is. The power plant has a nice visual overhaul. The random junk piles have been given a bit of variety. There are oil drums, machinery, computer equipment that make it more properly feel like an abandoned structure that people used to use. Raichu's been dropped from the encounter table, which is hardly a surprise, but losing the stone evo mons does make the game feel a little sanded down. Many of the Pokemon in the dungeon have static, which makes the trip through it a lot more tedious, and it's one of the few areas in the game that abilities are actually a hindrance on the original design. Like in Celadon, Saffron's opulence is better shown off in the skyscrapers in the city, especially with Sylph's redesign as a huge glass structure. The dojo remains mostly the same, although thanks to breeding, the Hitmons are no longer one-offs through their mutual pre-evolution in the post-game. In Sylph, thanks to improved movesets, Blue's team is a bit more lethal, but the same convoluted design of the dungeon is in place, somewhat mitigated by running and the ability to know what floor you're on, which makes navigating it a lot easier and quicker. As before, nobody in Sabrina's gym knows what a psychic type is, and its puzzle remains unchanged. Sabrina's team is a touch more dangerous, synchronize on Kadabra and Alkazam make them difficult to use status against, and her three psychics all use Calm Mind, one of the best boosting moves in the series, which also enables a bunch of Pokemon to use the TM after beating her, opening up a lot of powerful special sets. If you can imagine, the water routes are virtually unchanged, 19, 20, 21. All straight routes of water, loaded with tentacles and swimmers wielding water types. The routes have a nice touch in that the formerly straight artificial walls are now replaced with jagged rows of rocks, which makes the routes a bit more naturalistic. Seafoam is also largely unchanged, the bluish walls and floor give a nice icy touch, separating them from the game's other various caves and telegraphing the dungeon theme, and some icy rocks are placed around the area, but largely things are basically the same. The encounter table has shifted a bit for the worse. Like yellow, the upper floors heavily lean towards Zubat and Golbat, neither of which are an issue at this point, but are just a bit of an eye roller. Articuno is thankfully blessed with a bit more to do, insofar as it has much wider moveset via TMs, which can give it a lot stronger utility. All legendaries in this game have the same ability pressure, which while not very useful on the player's end, can generally make them a bit tougher to catch as your PP drains really fast, although all three of the legendary birds have a range of common weaknesses that make them decently easy to chip down on quickly. On Cinnabar, Where's the dock? It's just dirt now. How do the ships land? It's not like Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald didn't have docks for them to reuse. That whole game is water and docks. As before, the lab can be used to revive the fossils, although unlike red, blue, and yellow, where they'd be revived at a decent if moderately lacking level 30, here they come back at 5. Catching up from 30 is doable. From 5? When these things just level up at a snail's pace in general from their level up group anyway? This late in the game? It's not a worthwhile investment and that sucks. If they were, they'd be good. The Kabutops and Aerodactyl especially now have access to much wider move pools, including rock moves for both, never mind Ancient Power, which makes them much more solid compared to their rather shallow, normal-type focus move pools from before. While the layout of the mansion hasn't changed, the detail in it starkly contrasts Cinnabar. The upper floors have a unique tile pattern on the floor and windows along the wall, as well as computer equipment scattered throughout to hint at its usage as a secret lab for a time. The details even extend to the upper floor having unique tiles on its walkways, while the lower floor has its own design on the floor, all of which make the area feel like it has a lot of effort put into it to stand out. It's also worth noting that both Ponyta and Magmar have been moved out of the mansion, making them even more inaccessible than they already were, but I'll loop back to that shortly. Ditto also appears here. Intentional or not, this has led to a lot of speculation on the connection to Mewtwo, although I think that that's largely pretty unfounded. It still appears in other places in the game and it wasn't there in red and blue. The similarities to me are moderately interesting, but in this scenario I don't think there's meant to be a proper aspect of storytelling through encounter tables here in the same way that the slow spiral from basic birds and mice to more and more strange things is. 
As in yellow, the quizzes must at least be attempted in the Cinnabar Gym, although the translations of the questions has been polished up to make them a lot less clunky. Blaine still suffers basically the same way he had before. You walk into this nearly guaranteed to be using something with Surf, which means that even in regards to him using two Pokemon with Intimidate, it does very little to slow down anything using said move. Defeating Blaine opens up the first major deviation from the original game, the Sevi Isles. Bill pulls up to the shoreline because the dock is gone. Good lord. He wrote a scene with a boat. What is this? Just... why? Bill asks for your help. You can tell him to eat shit and just go about yourself until later, although there's very little reason to do so as far as I know, and if rushing through it's a fairly short 30 odd minute detour, although doing so makes it even less interesting than it already is. This excursion covers the first of the three, nine, Sevi Isles, beginning on one island, the island, and the name of the town on it. Bill's friend Celio is working on repairing the PC system on the island. You can't swap Pokemon until you reach three island, and in the downtime, Bill wants you to deliver a rock to someone on two island. One island is the largest of the three, and while you can just skip over to two, there's at least some things to see here. To the south of the main city is Treasure Beach, Persian and Tangla here are neat, but more interestingly the beach has hidden items that respawn periodically by step count. Mostly just high priced sellables like pearls and stardust, which help you get balls and, you know, build up to the stupid fucking game corner stuff. To the east is Kindle Road, which is the new home to Ponyta and Rapidash. If nothing else, Rapidash is neat because it didn't have availability in Red and Blue, although Yellow had it in Cerulean Cave. The Ember Spa on this route has a hot spring carried over from Ruby and Sapphire, which acted as quick healing points, as well as the HM for Rock Smash. Getting this isn't necessary for progression anywhere, even in the post game, but can be used along Kindle Road and various other spots in the Isles to reach items, and also have encounters for Geodude and Graveler, which is otherwise unavailable in the wild. Graveler, not Geodude, obviously. North up Kindle Road is Mount Ember, a volcano you'd be forgiven for not realizing is that. Magmar is only found here, leaving it in a fairly awkward spot of being locked to an optional area of an area that, after you leave, you can only return to in the post-game. Moltres is also moved here, giving it its own proper spot instead of being awkwardly crammed into Victory Road. It's not nearly as strong an area as the other two have still, only having a brief strength puzzle that while decently complex isn't all that difficult, but I guess it's a nice gesture for Moltres regardless. Two Island is a tiny, tiny island without much to see. The eponymous city only has two things, the Move Relearner and the Joyful Game Corner. Two mini games that can be played exclusively in multiplayer, which is run by the guy Bill wants a rock delivered to, although his panic over his missing daughter on Three Island delays this quest. The only other area of Two Island is Cape Brim, a very small path to a house where a woman will teach the starter their signature Hyper Beam clone, Frenzy Plant, Blast Burner, Hydro Cannon. Uh, none of these are very good. Three Isle is where the gameplay of this side track takes place. Beginning at Three Isle Port, bikes can be seen terrorizing Citizen. Dunsparce is available here, although like with the Gen 2 evolutions, it's sealed behind the post game with an arbitrary block, which is kind of disappointing, as having a drip of access to some of the weaker or weirder Gen 2 Pokemon in the late game could spice things up a little bit. The town of Three Island has nothing of note, but this first visit has the upper part blocked by bikers. Funny enough, you have to fight all four in a row, making it more challenging, hypothetically, than most gyms. All the Pokemon that they use are fairly weak. To continue the fascinating idea of gameplay, Bond Bridge to the West features some grass and trainers, and then that connects to the Berry Forest, a fairly short dungeon that does differentiate visually from Viridian a little bit and that its trees are yellow. The dungeon doesn't have anything that's all that interesting, unfortunately. Cut can be used to skip grass in a few areas by cutting down trees, and Execute is available outside of the Misery of the Safari Zone, but it's pretty linear and straightforward and ends in a battle with a Hypno, because like its deck entries implies, it kidnapped the Game Corner guy's child which is interestingly dark. It's also level 30 and you'll almost certainly one-shot it. With the girl saved, the rock can be delivered and the whole thing wraps up, returning the game to the tracks laid for it by its predecessor. From here, really all there is to do is to go up to Viridian City, Jim with honestly nothing to say about it. The layout is the same and the faster spinners is nice, but Giovanni was never impressive now and is still relatively unimpressive here. Nidoking and Nido Queen's poison points are theoretically annoying, but as with Blaine, Surf pretty handily cleans up. Hell, all of his Pokemon have Earthquake, which is an incredible move, and his Rhyhorns have non-normal moves in Rock Blast but it truly, honestly, is not going to matter. <laughs> Giovanni's little speech at the end is also kind of weird. Not so much for anything in this game, it's the same speech as before, with his intent to give up crime, but it doesn't really gel with the remake timeline's canon because of the Arkhold Soul Silver, like, stupid Selby event thing. 
Row 23 is still fittingly grandiose. The tiles and arches look really nice, and that the music isn't interrupted while surfing is a really nice touch. The bike music would get overwritten in red and blue to keep up the atmosphere, but would still switch to the surf music. Here both are properly switched off to allow the music to play. There isn't much to say on Victory Road either. Shocker, I know. The same tedious segments of pushing rocks across the entire floor here, and without Moltres, the dungeon is a little more empty. The crater in the spot where it once stood is a nice detail, although I'm not sure what it implies lore-wise that Moltres lived here and then went to Mount Ember for some reason, or I don't know, like obviously it's just meant to be a visual easter egg, but you know. The Elite Four do follow in Yellow's footsteps with much more diverse movesets, which makes them way more reasonable battles. It's also worth noting that after clearing the Sevi Islands post-game quest, the Elite Four gets snazzy new teams, not only raising the levels of their Pokémon, but introducing new, more interesting moves and even some second-generation Pokémon, although none of them get a third-generation Pokémon added to their team in the way that uh, Heart Gold and Soul Silver gave a few of them Generation 4 Pokémon. Lorelei has gotten significantly more interesting. A few of her Pokémon use Hail, which can be a small but significant drain on health. Dugong's Thick Fat nullifies its fire neutrality, and Lapras, like the other Elite Four Ace Pokémon, has a Citrus Berry. It'd be cool if they had more interesting items, although the player doesn't have a lot of access to items either, but it does force aggression and make their strongest Pokémon a bit more dangerous. In the post-game, bless her heart, Lorelei finally drops Slow who is still not a nice type for Palaswine, whose ground typing gives her team a solid chunk of variety from the water, water, water. Bruno is still... Bruno. His dual onyxes now have actual moves in Earthquake, Rock Tomb, and Iron Tail, but they're still onyx. Guts on Machamp can be really nasty, and Hitmachan has dropped the worthless elemental punches to just play into its solid fighting move lineup. On rematch... oh. Bruno, buddy. Steelix isn't a fighting type either. Everything gets way more solid moves too, but there's not much to his rematch. Agatha's strategies haven't particularly changed, Toxic, Confusion, Hypnosis, Spam. But what's new is abilities. Levitate makes Haunter and the Gengar significantly harder to hit. Earthquake, which formerly wiped her, is no longer an option, and the alternatives are a bit raw. Dark is still a rather under-established type with very few moves, and nothing with the type for stab is available because Umbreon doesn't... You can't evolve in Umbreon and all the dark types are post-game. Meanwhile, Ghost and Psychic get mauled if outsped. Not to mention Arbok's Intimidate can be a really nasty barrier too. In the post-game, her Golbat evolves. While not a ghost, it is a significant power jump, and at least has Shadow Ball. And Haunter is dropped for Mischievous. Her Pokémon also have much wider variety of moves in general in the post-game, with Gengar's Thunderbolt, Psychic, Sludge Bomb, Arbok's Earthquake, Giga Drain. Lance is actually significantly worse than in Yellow, largely doing the same Hyper Beam stuff he did previously. Although Dragon having actual moves like Outrage and Twister is nice. The massive coverage given to his Pokémon is instead safe for his rematch, or one of his Dragonairs replaced with his second Dragonite, while the other is dropped for the extremely difficult to deal with Kingdra, presumably on loan from his cousin Claire. Blue is not too highly changed either. Better movesets and Intimidate is guaranteed on at least one of his Pokemon if not two, which can definitely turn him into a bit of a wall, but largely still the same old blue. However, in the postgame he gets some pretty cool changes. Heracross and Tyranitar are both pretty wicked. Heracross replaces Pidgeot, it's a bit of a glass cannon, but unprepared it can punch some huge holes, and Tyranitar replaces Rhydon. It's both exceedingly powerful and puts the whole fight on a clock with permanent sandstorm. But he doesn't have any mitigation for that himself, it's still a huge dent in almost anything you would have too. Otherwise, everything else plays out pretty much the same. I don't know how it couldn't. You defeat Blue, Professor Oak shows up, calls his grandson a loser for some reason. Uh, and then stuff just, you know, you go back to the start. Cerulean Cave is locked behind the misery of the Sevi Isles. I really, really do not think the Sevi Isles are very good. I touched on them before, but to dive deeper into them, they're just dull. Each island is patched together from reused assets that don't particularly have islandy features, nor really anything all that interesting in general. Towns look like any other, and at best you can say that routes are a bit more naturalistic. Very few have roads, and they often flip between ocean travel and land travel at random, but it's just not exciting, and there's very few spots amongst it all that are. Not only that, but outside of random trainers sprinkled about, all the storyline fights are against more rockets using basically rocket stuff, which is an extremely underwhelming finale coming out of the Elite Four. 
The most interesting aspect of the islands are the availability of Johto Pokemon, although even then the game is over basically. You have very little to use them on, and even if you did, almost all of them are found at extremely low levels, 15, 20, while well, the Kano Pokemon on the same route around them are in the 40s and 50s. At best, you can evolve stuff you use through the game for the final few rockets, uh, I did this for Crobat, but it's largely worthless. Before moving on to the remaining islands, one island has a brief detour to Ember Path in Mount Ember, a very short and linear tunnel to reach the ruby, something Celio is looking for to enable trade with ruby, sapphire, and emerald. There's some rockets, and the cave has a short strength puzzle, and Slugma, the first gen 2 Pokemon most people encounter, but it's over and done with, and on to the new islands pretty much immediately after it begins. This whole post-game, if done efficiently, can be plowed through in an hour and a half, further making it feel like a whimper of an ending. Four Island is one of the very few interesting spots in Sevi, not just for the proper daycare either, but because it's the hometown of Lorelei. You can visit her house and see that it's filled with Pokemon plushes. That this little bit of character for her is just a one-off only for her and none of the other Elite Four or gym leaders is kinda nice. Just like, this little thing about one character. And that's further expanded by Four Island's only other area, Icefall Cave, which is a disappointingly small cave with some good ideas that happens to contain most of Laura Lee's team. Dugong Slowpoke Shelter, her post-game Swinub, and even a 1% encounter chance for Lapras, rounding out everything her team has but Jinx, which isn't natively available in Kanto. Which again, is a really nice way to expand on her character and, you know, shows how she got all her Pokémon. It's very cool. Icefall is really disappointing. The ice tiles that break the second time they're stepped on could be a really cool puzzle element, but it's a few seconds at most for a wholly original puzzle type, and the sliding ice puzzle is hardly any longer. At the top you get to fight some rocket grunts with Laura Lee, but it's not even in a double battle. It's just yet another Team Rocket fight while she stands there. <laughs> I'm not even sure if you need to do this for the storyline progression, but it's a shame that the dungeon is so wimpy. Five Island is one empty-ass town. Eastward is Five Island Meadow, it's a simple grassy area with a rocket base, although that's locked until the passwords are obtained further in the postgame. Even further on from that is Memoria Pillar, a route that wouldn't be very notable save the namesake of the route, a large pillar that serves as the grave of a deceased onyx, one of Sevi Island's few interesting unique areas, which is just a small, tiny story tucked in the middle of an otherwise pretty slow area. North of Five is Water Labyrinth, it's just like a maze of rocks in the sea that leads to a man who gives the player a Togepi egg, pretty much just there for a tiny bit more dex completion. There's really, you're not gonna hatch up this Togepi and drag it around until it evolves into Togetic this late in the game. Hell, most of these Johtomons only exist to make them available when they weren't in Ruby and Sapphire for dex completion, but I guess it's one of the better rewards that the Sevi Islands can even offer. Even further is Resort Gorgeous. There's some unique trainers called Painters that hang out near it and use Smeargles, and the Smeargles all have a bunch of different moves, which is a kind of funny gimmick. And in the house, after completing the nearby mini dungeon, you can show the girl inside a Pokemon she asked for to receive some gifts, rare candies, nuggets, and so on. Speaking of the mini dungeon, Lost Cave is another disappointing one. The gimmick works like the Lost Woods in Zelda's, and the telegraphing is neat. The amount of rocks in each room, 3, 6, 9, or 12, are clock hand directions indicating the path to the Lost Girl. So you follow those through, and if you don't, then it sends you back to the start. It's not terrible, but once you figure it out, the cave only takes a few minutes to blow through. The cave also has hidden treasure rooms found by taking specific paths through the caves, but finding them without a guide is a lengthy exercise in guessing and checking, and I don't know how anyone bothered. They have no telegraphing, despite housing important items like incenses used to breed Why Not and Azrael, which are the only two Generation 3 Pokemon available, as well as these item rooms having increased odds at Murkrow and Mischievous, who are the big prizes of the dungeon. Like Icefall, it's an interesting idea, but it's just too short to ever have time to build on it. Six Island, it's a town. It connects to Water Path, which is a sea route. Green Path to the north exists to house a new forest dungeon, Pattern Bush. It's just a giant patch of grass with a pattern in it of some kind. It vaguely resembles a circuit board, although that's kind of speculative on my part, but it is funny because it'd be a circuit board filled with bugs. Letty Boss, Spinarak, and Heracross included. Love Heracross. Waterpath finally goes to Outcast Island, an odd empty little island with a small cave called Altering Cave. In the game as it is, this cave is only filled with low-level Zubats, although this was intended to be an event area that never got released, which would cycle Pokémon that was available in the cave. Mary, Apom, Pineco, Shuckle, Teddy Ursa, Houndour, Stantler, and Smeagle. None of which are otherwise in Fire Red and Leaf Green, although all of these would be added to Emerald Safari expansion, despite that game also having an altering cave of its own. And all of these would at least have one member of their evolutionary family in Coliseum to make them available in Fire Red and Leaf Green regardless of Emerald. 
It's an interesting relic, an area for an event that never was. Although it can be pretty easily re-enabled through hacking, it's not really all that interesting to do because it's just catching, like, low-level Mary, but... Coming back south from Waterpath is Rune Valley, a large but straightforward area packed with Johto Pokemon, Natu, Yanma, Wobbuffet, Meryl, Wooper, and it spirals into another very small dungeon, Dotted Hole, where the Sapphire Celio needs is actually located. The dungeon has a neat gimmick that ties back to some of Ruby and Sapphire's puzzles, a short maze whose directions are recorded in braille. Like everything else, it's not complicated or long enough and lacks encounters, let alone interesting ones. Like everything else that's been in the post game, it, it's not complicated or long enough to actually be all that satisfying. You only need to read the directions four times, so it's like up, left, down, right. Before the player gets the sapphire, it's stolen by rocket scientist Gideon, unlocking the rocket hideouts. Like the game corner hideout, the gimmick here is the spinners, and the maze is actually really solid, requiring some backtracking along it, featuring lengthy chains that shoot you all over. It's not a bad finale as far as dungeon goes, even if it's still a little too short, given that you can solve it in like three or four spins if you know where to go, but the maze is complicated enough that the first time through it'll probably give you a little trouble. The two rocket admins you fight are kinda interesting. The female uses Vileplume and the male Houndoom, meaning they're likely supposed to be the admins from the Radio Tower in Johto, which is an interesting detail if nothing else. These Sevi Isle rockets went on to do the gold-silver crystal stuff, because they were kinda out of the loop given how far away they were from the main base. As for Gideon, I really like his team. Porygon and Magneton are really awesome. They're also in their mid-40s, so it's a cakewalk fight to end a series of cakewalk fights. They're completely underleveled and they do not do enough. And all the stuff he has is really slow too. Beating this unlocks two things, Cerulean Cave and the Legendary Beasts. A very odd quirk of this game. Depending on which starter you chose after clearing the warehouse, one of the legendary beasts begins roaming Kanto mainland. Entei for Bulbasaur, Suicune for Charmander, or Raikou for Squirtle. That it's a hard one-off for the beast is a bit irritating, although as a post-game bonus I can't be too mad. And all three are in Coliseum, which makes them a lot more accessible than doing this three times or whatever. What's far more concerning about them is the Roar Bug. Entei and Raikou both have Roar, and if they use it, they're gone forever. Suicune is free from this curse as it doesn't have Roar, but honestly, roamers are bad enough as it is that it's worth just masterballing any of them regardless. Granted, they do use the improved roaming mechanics present in Hard Cold and Soul Silver with dumber roamers, so you're not going to be chasing them down for 8 hours like in Gold, Silver, and Crystal, but even then they can be a big irritation. The fact that Raikou and Entei just delete themselves from the game if they roll bad? Ugh. You also never technically need to go to Seven Island. It's not an element of the post-game storyline, although it does house some interesting things. North of the town is the Trainer Tower, which is just a small battle facility with some simple modes. Eight single battles, eight double battles, 24 single battles where each opponent only uses one Pokemon, or Mixed Mode, which is a random mashup of these three. These give some decent rewards, repeat upgrades, Dragon Scales, Metal Coat, and King's Rock, although the tower is extremely basic and doesn't offer a lot. No complex gimmicks, and with the items allowed between battles, it just becomes a war of attrition. South of Seven is the canyon entrance, then Seavolt Canyon. These areas don't have a lot going on. I mean, Larvitar is here and that's cool. Tanabe Key in the canyon is a small cave with one of the series' more intense strength puzzles, one that I actually had to retry a few times in order to get it down, and not just from getting too distracted to move blocks correctly like in other dungeons. The compact space is a real challenge to moving all four blocks onto the buttons, and this unlocks the Tanabe Chambers in the next area. Seven caves along the Tanabe Ruins that contain the unknown. Unceremoniously shoved on the optional island as they didn't cleanly fit into Ruby, Sapphire, or Emeralds. As a whole, the Sevi Island just feels undercooked. Blue balling the Johto Mons with low levels so that even in this brief post game they're useless. Incredibly small, short dungeons that while sometimes having good ideas and unique puzzle elements just get dumpstered before they have any impact. And uh, the story, so to call it, is a one and a half hour romp consisting of another onslaught of rockets to no story beats with no interesting rival or boss, just rockets. Okay, finally time to wrap up. Cerulean Cave is just a nice, easy finale. The layout matches red and green, the second strongest layouts, although I think this cave, mostly by coincidence, ends up with a good set of encounters to tie it all together. Electrode speed makes it really hard to run from, and it has both Thunder Wave and Static, which can make it a big, big pain to get past. Magneton and Golbat have status of their own in Tri-Attack and, uh, Poison Fang. And Parasect has Effect Spore, but the most devious addition is high-level Wobbuffet. 
pretty much the only high level Johto Mon you're gonna get. Shadow Tag makes it inescapable, and as its shtick is, it becomes a gamble to not get one-shotted by counter or mirror coat. It's at low enough percentages to not be a constant pain in the ass, but just enough that you're gonna be forced into fighting it once or twice which makes the cave a lot more intense, even just trying to get to Mewtwo, where otherwise you can just run away from everything. Mewtwo is significantly weaker than in Red and Blue, although it's still a hell of a powerhouse, just one that can't take the same amount of punishment because its special defense has been nuked. It still has an immense ability to decimate teams, Recover makes keeping it at low health a constant back and forth, and Pressure is a drain on sleep-based catching strategies as well as in general because you have to keep weakening it with Recover. It's a really good finale, especially because you're pretty much going to want to use the Master Ball on the Legendary Beast, which makes Mewtwo a lot more difficult in its own right. And you know, as before, it kind of it's a nice good ending and really makes up for the blindness of the Sevi Isles. Okay, okay, last one for real, some event islands. I love events that force you to catch the Pokemon and events that have little unique areas. It's a shame they're gone. I imagine it was just a lot of work for something that maybe half a percent of players would see, but it's still a great little thing to just have for those players who do get it. While these events are long out of circulation, they can both be re-enabled through hacking, obviously. The Mystic Ticket allows access to Naval Rock. Honestly, the island itself isn't that exciting. It's a series of long hallways that connect to ladders that go down to the basement or up to the exterior. The basement contains Lugia. At level 70, it's pretty huge, and like Mewtwo, packs recover, although it's significantly less capable of destroying whole teams as it only has Swift and Hydro Pump for attacking move, which Hydro Pump has 70 accuracy and 5 PP. While the peak has Ho Ho, which is essentially the same thing going on, but with Fire Blast. Both are still rock sturdy, hard hitters, and difficult catches, although not to the extent of Mewtwo, and you could technically get these at any time after the Elite Four and use them if you really wanted to. Uh, I think that kind of be cheating to at least a few extents. Nonetheless, that you actually have to cheat to get the ticket, but. The Aurora ticket allows access to Birth Island, which has a pretty neat puzzle associated with it. The odd triangle center stage in the island moves when interacted with. The puzzle is harder to figure out than execute on, requiring you to travel between its positions in the few steps possible for it to move again. There isn't a lot of feedback, so depending on how focused you are, you may get this accidentally on your first try or feel completely mystified about its movements, and I think that's kind of cool as a puzzle element. This gives access to Deoxys, who has a kind of opposite challenge to the other legendaries being encountered at level 30. It has an extremely difficult time damaging you, but its already relative frailty and extremely low level make it difficult to manage getting to low health unless you're on a full swipe build or something like that of course, which forces you to play very carefully, which itself is a neat change of pace. Deoxys is kinda odd here. In every game starting in generation 4, Deoxys' form can be changed at will between its normal attack, defense, and speed. In these games, it's based on which version you have. Fire Red will always be attack form and leaf green defense. Uh, the attack form is much, much better than the defense form. <laughs> Alright, awesome. Before we wrap up, let's talk about special. You know I love it. I don't love this arc, honestly. It's not all bad, seeing more of the original characters never could be, also managing to hit every main Sevi Isle as well as Birth Isle and making them all at least a bit relevant to the story is a solid effort. I think there's a few hang-ups in general, first and foremost the art. I feel a bit bad hitting on it, but the change of artist from Mato to Yamamoto is very noticeable here. And Chris Lee tried pretty hard to maintain the style, and he had a more firm grasp on it for the Gold, Silver, and Crystal characters, even when they reappeared in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Whereas art on the Red, Blue, and Yellow guys is just not nearly up to Mato's level. Still good, but a little more bland in my opinion, and that's mostly unfortunate circumstances. But especially if you read them back to back as I did, Red, Blue, and Yellow is just so much stronger in general art style and in action. I mean, there's something about the eye shape that changes most characters a little bit, and Blue especially looks like an entirely different character beyond the fact that they arbitrarily changed her outfit to match Leafs in Fire Red and Leaf Green. It kind of extends out to her hair color, face design, just doesn't work for me as well as the red, blue, and yellow designs did. Secondly, the plot doesn't facilitate what I like in this manga very much. The fire red and leaf green arc is so compact and fast paced that has no time for Monster of the Week stories. Pretty much immediately just going beat to beat from the start with the rocket stuff, which isn't made better by the rockets just not being that strong. The main villains here are Car, Orm, and Surd, all of whom are based on movie monsters. They're just kind of dull and only improve towards the end with Car's betrayal that forces some good drama. Deoxys is the central focus here and will get some good fights, especially with Mewtwo near the end. The lack of variety in fights because of it makes the arc drag a little bit. 
I do like that Giovanni's plot isn't for destruction, but to reunite with Silver, who if you remember was kidnapped as a child. Despite everything, the two have some sweet moments, like Giovanni saving Silver at the cost of almost dying, and that's one of the stronger elements of the story, although that doesn't come into play until the last four or five chapters. The cliffhanger is also a bit much, as Surd turns all the protagonists to stone, which wouldn't be resolved for a good while, although it is impressive that the story would eventually loop around to the Deoxys ending, where it goes off to find its missing companion, although that's not until Auras, which is many, many years later. I don't know, Fire Red and Leaf Green is still a good arc with strong action, but it never really feels like it comes fully together. It more or less feels like an interim for the next chapters that they spun their wheels on for a while while waiting for the games to release. If this chapter didn't exist, save for some cute stuff with Silver, you wouldn't feel like you miss much and the protagonists don't really grow or change. It's certainly not awful, but it feels lackluster in most aspects relative to the brilliance of red, blue, yellow, and gold, silver, and crystal. Thankfully, that's it. No other manga, no anime, nice and simple. As the series progressed, the need for alternative media to fill in the gaps of what the games could do shrunk and shrunk, and therefore, only the best of the media remains. Well, that's not true, the Ash anime is still going, but... Outside of the really, really profitable for little babies anime, only the best remain. <laughs> okay, I, I forgot to write about my teams because I'm stupid. I can kind of improv it. In Fire Red, I used Charizard, who did the usual Charizard stuff. You know, Dragon Claw is a nice bit of coverage for it. Uh, Flamethrower, I gave it Fly because, you know, I had it. I used Crobat, who was a Golbat for most of the game. As a Golbat, it was really kind of stink. It had its uses, like Poison Fang is kind of useful in general, and like Aerial Ace. Uh, once it evolved into Crobat, it got a lot better, but it didn't do that until the post game. Also, it got really annoying that Crobat kept trying to evolve. Pretty much like right after I beat Koga, every time it leveled up, it'd be like, it can't evolve. And I was like, oh, well, then stop telling me. Uh, I used Snorlax. Snorlax is pretty much just fucking incredible. I just gave it a bunch of like strong physical physical moves, you know. Strength Earthquake. Golduck was my surfer. I, I tried to do like, I gave it Calm Mind so that it could do Confusion Calm Mind and Surf, and then I accidentally er erased Calm Mind with Rock Smash, so I really fucked up its moveset. Uh, it wasn't very good, but you know, Surf is good enough. I actually used Golem. I thought it'd be funny. He actually turned out to be fairly decent, you know. He does Earthquake, Rock Slide, he's just a big physical hitter, he's really bulky against physical attacks. There's just like a lot of battles you can't send him out in, because any like Water Gun or Razor Leaf, he's just dead. And then Jolteon, Jolteon's another one of those really simple Pokemon, it was just like Thunderbolt, Double Kick, Pin Missile, you know? It fills that little niche well of being the Thunder guy. As for Leaf Green, I used Venusaur. It's generally a lot more useful in this game, given it has like Sleep Powder way earlier. Electrode? Electrode didn't do anything. It's awful. It's <laughs> easily my worst Pokemon. Even as something that just used Thunderbolt, it really was not that good. For my Surfer, I used Tentacruel. Tentacruel's really bulky, which is the best thing about it. It pretty much, like, it got Sludge Bomb, which it doesn't use all that well. And even, like, Surf, it's not the strongest user of, but it's really bulky, so it's hard to kill. It's a good wall and it can get like poison off, so that's kind of like my thought with it. Porygon 2 was one that I indulged in. Obviously it was a Porygon until the post game, but you know, I just gave it like a wide range of coverage. So it had Tri-Attack, it had Thunderbolt, it had Ice Beam. So it was kind of just like filled in for whatever I needed it to be at any given time because it just has such wide coverage. Trace is also occasionally useful. Trace isn't that good in this game, particularly because Tracing Intimidate doesn't properly work in this game. So like Intimidate won't activate properly. And so like I couldn't send it in against a Gyarados to get the Intimidate drop there, but there were times where it came in handy where I could like copy fly fire off a of Growlithe or something. Rhydon pretty much did the same thing that Golem did. I think it's a substantially better Pokemon, but it's a way bigger pain in the ass to train. And then Dragonite. I actually, I used Dragonite, which was kind of a pain in the ass because you have to catch it first and then train it a lot. And it was a Dragonair up until like halfway through the Elite Four, at which point it got substantially better. I didn't do anything that fancy with it. It had a fly wing attack. I didn't have fly up until then. Dragon Claw, whatever. It was kind of just like another mostly physical bulky hitter. It's really bulky, it's hard to kill, and even though like Dragonite's like mostly mediocre, it was able to hold its own just because it's statistically so good. So, what do I think of Fire Red and Leaf Green? I don't know. Honest to God, it's not much of an improvement over red and blue. Pros and cons, I guess. 
I think stripping out a lot of Red and Blue's unique aesthetic touches makes a region that was largely already intentionally boring even more boring and doesn't greatly serve to make it any more enjoyable at the very least, with the excess of trees and reused tile sets giving it this bland, mushy flavor. The addition of more complex battle mechanics and strategies, held items, weather abilities, and double battles is appreciable and makes the gameplay elements a bit stronger, but on the same side, the game clearly isn't all that well designed around all these new elements. Most trainers use few or none of these. I don't think there's a single trainer that uses weather until the Lorely rematch. None of them use held items except citrus berries in the Elite Four. Held items are pretty much post-game only for the player as well. Abilities are only notable when they're obstructive, because they've been applied to areas that weren't balanced around them existing, like Lavender Tower, where ground types have the rug pulled out from under them, or, you know, the power plant where everything has static. Not to mention the amount of double battles in the game can be counted on one hand. I think more positively that Gen 3 has the strongest move pool balance in the game, landing pretty nicely between everything uses garbage normal type moves like in Generation 1, and everything has a perfect move pool and substantial coverage as generations going forward would increasingly fall victim to. The game's devotion to being just like the originals is kind of weird to me. Locking off evolutions for Blissey and Crobat specifically feels so strange as both are not all that great for single player even evolved and have very weak pre-evolutions that would make a nice surprise if they could evolve, but it's made even weirder when the game does change things around seemingly arbitrarily. I don't mean improving movesets, which I appreciate, but just shuffling stuff around on routes and adding a bunch of new exclusives, cutting off access to a bunch of stuff that was freely available before. The largest chunk of new content is the Sevi Isles, which are just not very good. It's two fairly short and easy story segments that are based around fighting another dozen or so generic rockets. The islands themselves aren't exciting to explore visually or in dungeon design, and the Johto Pokemon are so, so extremely low leveled that there's no point in even bothering to engage with them for use and they are only there for dex filler, and because they're so low leveled, they're a pain in the ass to grind up for dex filler. The Sevi Island is so short that you'd be hard pressed to use any of this new stuff, and unlike Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the only available Gen 3 Pokemon are Why Not and Azrael. You just don't get much variety from what was around in Red, Blue, and Yellow. It's not that Fire Red and Leaf Green is bad, it's just on par with Red, Blue, and Yellow, maybe? Maybe a little bit under? Its advancements don't balance out the simple charm that Red, Blue, Yellow had, and the weird nitpicks pile up for a game that never fully feels like it comes together. I think I'd return to Red and Blue before Fire Red and Leaf Green. I think it's a goodish game that just can't take that extra step to being great, like Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Gold, Silver, Crystal. So I think that's where I wrap this up. Let's go Pikachu and Eevee shouldn't be that far off. I, I'm working on it. I'm trying my best.